morning. Thanks very much for an embarrassing introduction. Of course, Luciano has, uh, you know, is one of the brilliant people I've worked with. So that's a trick to do brilliant research. <laughs> so, okay. So uh, this is a talk actually about sensor networks, essentially. And um, it's work done in collaboration with a large team of PhD students, former PhD students, and, and you know, postdocs and colleagues at EPFL. So it, it's really an overview of, of many things we have done. And I'll pick out a few things which uh, I think are you know, maybe of uh, particular interest. And uh, as you will see from the outline, then I'll end up using Google Earth quite a bit. Uh, so there is a connection to Google, uh, ultimately. OK, so the way the talk is structured is uh, I'll tell you how, where this work actually orina originates from. It's from a big center we run at, at EPFL. And it's a center on ad hoc networking and, and sensor networking going from theory to applications. And, and you'll see we'll essentially cross all these levels here in the talk. And uh, the technical part are these three central uh, sections of the talk. One is about distributed signal processing. I'll explain what I mean by this. It's not standard signal processing, uh, but it's something we have uh, worked on for a few years now, and it's sort of cute. Um, we'll talk about some information theoretic result, but only you know, lightly, I will say, uh, about something which is called distributed source coding. Uh, when you have many, many sources all over the place and you try to code them together without having these sources talk to each other. Uh, and I'll show a, a result specifically on this. And then that's just uh, what I call the controversial part of the talk. There's always to be a, you know, some part that sort of wakes up the audience. I mean, maybe at Google it's not so controversial, but usually I, you know, I give these talks at places like Nokia and so on that are communications, pure communications companies. And you'll see that uh, sort of I, I put a question mark on one of the basic axioms, actually, of the digital uh, infrastructure, which is the so-called separation theorem. And then I'll do the fun part is actually talking about how we took some of that work and applied it to environmental monitoring. Uh, by doing actual deployments, working with user uh, communities in environmental monitoring, and then showing some results from there. OK, good. So let's get going. Thanks to the, the organizer, to Luciano in this particular case, and to a bunch of people and funding agencies and so on. Um, and as I said, uh, this work was done inside a center we have been running for almost 10 years now at EPFL, which is the Center for Mobile Information and Communication Systems. Um, usually I present this in the U.S. by saying it's a great center because uh, the budget keeps going up in U.S. dollars, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> of course, it has been flat in Swiss francs, which is the money we actually use. Uh, but it's similar to U.S. engineering research centers, which are big operations funded by the U.S. NSF. Um, and uh, what this thing does, oops, sorry. The network here has uh, EPFL as leading house, ETH, our sister institution. It has a bunch of uh, industrial uh, companies that are part of an industrial liaison program. I don't see Google, and we have to work on this, obviously. Um, and uh, as I said, it's a large network of about 30 faculty members, 100 PhD students, and so on. OK, so this sets the stage. What, what does this center do? It studies what could be the next generation of communications infrastructure. The center was launched at a time when uh, large uh, telecom operators had spent a lot of money, actually, 110 billion US dollars. Well, these days, with the financial industry going down the drains, this looks like a pittance, right? Well, it's 110 billion, right? It's sort of a small piece of you know, what uh, the bailout is these days. But uh, in these days, 10 years ago, this looked like a lot of money. And that's what telecom operators paid to get licenses for something called UNTS. And um, UNTS was essentially an epsilon variation on GSM. So that was a lot of money for not much technological innovation. And, um, and you, of course, you know the story. Essentially, these guys went bust because this didn't really happen because uh, it was the end of the internet bubble. Um, but anyway, when we looked at the problem, we said, well, we propose a long-term research program. We are not going to work on UNTS because that's totally boring, besides being too expensive for what it is. But we're going to think if we could change what is the current communications infrastructure, which is backbones based on, um, on uh, fiber optic networks, 
and last mile sort of uh, wireless access that might be you know 10 miles but it's essentially the last hop is wireless and then you have a classical wired communications infrastructure and so we propose to actually study all variations of what's known as ad hoc networking where essentially you say well we have a gazillion people running around with android phones right you see i prepared the talk uh, <laughs> so if you have a million people you know in the zurich region you probably can call from from Bahnhof Enge to, to ETH by doing uh, nearest neighbor communication multi-hop uh, to the destination, right? And I also remember taking this slide and going to Swisscom to try to sign them up for the industrial liaison program, and they really didn't think it was funny to have a wireless service without an operator, okay, as you can guess. So <laughs> in the meantime, they understood they actually have to understand what is going on here because these things are actually happening, maybe not in their total, uh, you know, generic form, uh, because it's not so easy for information theoretic reasons and delay constraints and so on to do, for example, multi-hop for actual real-time services. But certainly in sensor networks, this is a primary way to actually run large-scale sensor networks, is to use multi-hop communication from all the sensors uh, through intermediate stations to a base station where you collect the data. And I'll come back to this uh, at the end when, when I show actual implementation. But from a theoretical point of view, it's extremely interesting to try to understand what is a vanilla, pure ad hoc network, what are its capacities, what, what could you achieve, how would you do source coding in such a network, and so on. And these are the sort of questions I try to address today. Okay, now um, for, you know, I'm a signal processing guy by training and by interest, and so sensor networks is, 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 is a fantastic field. It was unknown by signal processing people a few years ago, but the, it's the ultimate sampling device of the real world. Okay, you put, you put these uh, terminals, 100, 1,000, whatever, out in the world, and you get, of course, gazillion, uh, you know, huge amounts of data, which correspond to physical measurements of uh, physical quantities, and then, you know, the fun is to try to make sense out of this, to communicate and so on. And uh, the basic tenet is that computation is actually relatively cheap, even on very small, low power nodes. What's the killer is communication. This is all wireless communication. And uh, these, these devices have very low power. And therefore, you really have to be quite smart at doing your signal processing, your compression, and then your communication, so as not to completely deplete the power of these devices. Okay. Now, maybe one thing I want to, to point out, and uh, I, I presume Google being a, you know, the archetypal computer science company, this is maybe not in the center of your concerns, uh, but it actually does show up in applications that are uh, being done on the internet just as well. So the old view of communications is that you have a source, a mobile phone, you have a channel, a wireless channel, and you have a receiver, and also a mobile phone, and you want to go from A to B through this channel, and essentially everything is known about this, uh, up to some epsilon details that some people are still spending time to figure out. Um, and you know, this is essentially known since 1948 from a construct, from a mathematical point of view. And then the rest was, you know, I could say implementation details, but that would sort of annoy my friends in information theory. Uh, but, you know, if you look at it from a very abstract point of view, you know, Shannon essentially says it can be done, and here is a construction how to do it, right? Uh, and, and then, of course, great work went, went into it to actually make it happen, like mobile phone telephony. But the current view is very different. It's one where you have many, many sources, distributed sources. Uh, you have a distributed channel, and you have distributed receivers. So that's a so-called multi-user information theory problem. And this one, most questions are actually open, and many of the questions are, in my view, extremely hard to solve. And so the contrast between these two views of the world is very, very stark, okay? And of course, the view we have is this one, and we try to contribute to this field uh, by the methods that I'll explain. Okay, now, as Luciano mentioned, you know, I spend a lot of time in the US, and uh, so when I, I used to go over there, especially in the former eight years of presidency, which shall remain unnamed, uh, you know, my American friends would always say, you know, we work on homeland security, so what are you doing for homeland security, right? So after a while, I had to figure out what was homeland security, uh, which is not my cup of tea, I'll be very honest. Um, and, um, and then I decided I needed a slide to explain what was homeland security in Switzerland, right? 
I mean, the US, I, I, after you know, many, many uh, visits, I finally understood, well, sort of understood what the problem was. Uh, so, so I prepared this slide, which is the Swiss version of Homeland Security for American users. Uh, and it's the following. It says, well, we are in a mountainous country. The mountainous country has lots of snow in the winter. When you have too much snow, you get avalanches. It kills people. This is really a security problem. So how do you solve the problem? Well, uh, at the beginning of the winter season, when the snow has fallen, you put some sensors. You drop sensors by helicopter over the snowfield. Okay? And uh, these sensors should sit there for essentially six months. They should do triangulation to know their relative position. And whenever the snowfield starts to move, they should wake up very quickly, alert the people in the valley so they can wake up and run away. Okay. So that's a real challenging homeland security problem for Switzerland. Now, this is actually not easy. It, it essentially embodies all the questions of sensor networking. But you can also see that even though it's easy to state and it sort of looks like it can be done, this is very, very challenging to actually do. And uh, part of the team in the center is actually working on this. And they have actually a, a great deployment. I mean, that's not the actual experiment yet. But uh, in the Swiss Alps, in the Valais, you have a small valley that is just devoted to studying avalanches, right? This is really Switzerland. And uh, so they wait for a long time. And then they actually release avalanches. And they are going to do a deployment inside an avalanche where they can sort of understand the dynamics by having little balls that come down with the avalanche when it actually comes down the hill. OK, so that's the problem maybe we'll solve at some point. But to get there, we need to have some uh, you know, preliminary investigation, which is really what this talk is about. All right. So <clears throat> as I said, a sensor network is a sampling device, a spatial temporal sampling device. Spatially, you have sensors at various locations here. And temporally, you take a number of samples per second or, or per minute. And what these sensor networks are doing they are trying to measure physical phenomena. And physical phenomena are driven by, for example, partial differential equations. They are not some random you know, sequences of numbers. They are you know, related to the physics of the phenomenon. Okay? And uh, the sampling, of course, is very irregular because these guys sit wherever they sit. And uh, you have all the questions on you know, if you want to reconstruct, let's say, the temperature field over the snow mass, you know, how many sensors should you put, how many times per unit or per, per second should you measure the temperature, et cetera. Okay? And then you get this amount of data, and then you have to ask yourself, how do you do the compression problem, and then how you do the communication problem, and then ultimately, what you do with the data, what understanding can you uh, extract from there? I think then you give the data to Google, they will figure it out, right? <laughs> so OK, good. And uh, so in, in, in work over the years, we have looked at uh, two physical phenomena. One is light fields, and the other one is sound fields, because they are close to what we, uh, we understand well in terms of signal processing. And in particular, Luciano has worked uh, both on light fields and sound fields when he was back at, at, uh, at uh, EPFL. And uh, the light field problem is the following is that uh, you have a multiple camera system, and you want to know, or you have a moving camera, and you want to know how many cameras or how many views you need to acquire to be able to reconstruct uh, you know, a faceful image of reality. Right? Now, in terms of Google, this is like the street view problem. right? Uh, so let me just explain. So the planoptic function, as it is called, is this high dimensional thing, which is, for example, in this room is a camera with three-dimensional position and three uh, two-dimensional shooting angle. You have a time index and you have a uh, wavelength index that gives you seven dimensions, if I counted right. And uh, that would be, you know, if you would move the camera everywhere in this room and you would look in every direction, OK? And then you would ask the question, OK, that's an infinite number of views. How many views do I really need if later I want to synthesize any view at some level of accuracy? And the street view problem is that you, know, you drive through the street, so you want to reconstruct the thing as faithfully as, as you want. The question is you know, how many times you have to go, uh, at what uh, density you have to sample. OK, now there are results on this. And I'm not going to review the results on, on this particular problem, except to say that there are many instances of this. Uh, but you know, so people build, for example, camera arrays, which is you know, a two-dimensional version of that planoptic function. 
uh, plus you know the angles uh, depending on the optics. Uh, but these things are actually being constructed and are used for, for example, uh, image synthesis based on what's called light field interpolation. Now, we sort of asked a similar question for sound, and we said, okay, so if you have an opera hall and you are recording a concert, but then you would like to render the concert in any position, uh, you know, in, in the expensive seat, in the cheap seat, and so on, how many microphones should you put in that concert hall? So it's exactly the same question, okay? And, uh, and you can see that people are actually serious about building very large size uh, microphone arrays. Of course, these are useful because you can do beam forming and, and uh, noise cancellation and so on. But in this part of your case, you know, it says, okay, MIT, uh, you know, has put a thousand microphones. You know, how many microphones would you actually need to solve the problem, right? So. Uh, and uh, so we actually built systems like this, and uh, a fellow did his thesis, Guy Boisler, co-supervised with Luciano. The result is sort of interesting because it's, you know, a sampling theorem is the ultimate result, which says, okay, if you want to faithfully record spatial sound, here is a number of microphones you actually have to put into the room, okay? So, you know, like a sampling theorem a la Shannon Nyquist for, you know, you want to acquire a speech for a telephone conversation. Well you need to take 8,000 samples per second. This gives you a spatial temporal sampling theorem. Okay, now this tends to become a little bit technical, so I might actually gloss over it. Uh, but I think I, I made my point that there is an interesting question, how many microphones you should have and how many of these signals should you acquire at what resolution to have a faithful reconstruction. And the answer lies into analyzing something which is called we call it the plan acoustic function, uh, which is you know, the equivalent of the plan optic function. And it comes down to analyzing room impulse responses over space. So the room impulse response is what you hear. If I click my, my, uh, my fingers here, then you'll have an echo from the room which sort of characterizes the room. And if I move, you know, the echo pattern will actually change. And the question is, how much does it change? Once you see this and you do what uh, signal processing people do, they say, this looks messy. Let's go to Fourier domain, right? And if you take the Fourier transform of this, there is a very cute result, uh, which probably is known by physicists, but certainly not by uh, CS or, or signal processing people, which is that this, the Fourier transform of this very, very messy function has actually a very, very simple form. It's actually bound to this uh, bow tie shape or this, uh, this butterfly shape. Uh, this is spatial frequency. This is temporal frequency. And so if you decide to acquire sound up to 10 kilohertz, this will put a limit here. And then this will give you a sampling theorem because the repetition of these spectra in Fourier domain will overlap, you know, starting at some uh, frequency here. But up to this frequency omega naught, let's say 10 kilohertz, you can perfectly reconstruct the spatial temporal sound. Okay? And, uh, okay. and if you measure this thing in an actual room, this is a MATLAB simulation. This is actually measured in a room. You have a lot of noise, but essentially you see this butterfly spectrum. And once you have the butterfly spectrum, you can go out and solve many practical problems based on this purely physical insight, okay? which is you know, linked to the wave equation. Uh, which is a PDE, of course, that uh, describes sound uh, propagation. OK, so let me skip the theorem here. Um, uh, but simply to say what's interesting uh, is that once you have this, this tool, this sampling theorem, then just like in every other area where signal processing is used, you know, once you have the sampling theorem, you can go out and make many statements about what you can acquire from the real world to what precision and what sort of processing you can do on it. Okay. This is actually a very active area in, in the lab right now. And it's an application, for example, for echo cancellation in teleconferencing. Okay. I, I, I won't give the details here, but uh, uh, this is the sort of application these results have. OK, good. Um, I promised to talk a bit about distributed uh, source coding. Let me maybe explain the problem first. OK, let me skip the. Uh, the history of the topic, but it's a very, very simple question. Uh, you know, source coding, which I showed on the slide where I mentioned Shannon, source coding is you have a single source speech on a mobile phone. You want to compress it down to, I don't know, 96, uh, uh, 9.6 kilobits per second. 
to transmit over a single channel, okay, for a receiver. Now, in all these distributed cases, the, uh, the basic setup is different because you have several sources, let's say two, and the sources are distributed, so they cannot talk to each other. X and Y are at some separate location, and it would be too expensive for them to sort of talk to each other. And you want to send what you see at location X or source X and what you have at source Y. You want to send this to the receiver. Okay. And then the question is, okay, let's say you have two telephone conversations. Do you need two channels with 9.6 kilobits per second, or can you do better? Now, it's sort of fairly obvious that if these things are completely independent of each other, you're not going to gain anything, okay? So if you have, you know, two people speaking different languages and holding different conversations, unclear that you could gain anything. But many of the things we are looking at, in particular in this sensor networking, the two terminals look at data that is actually correlated, okay? And then the question is, can you do better than simply doing what Shannon said for the point-to-point -point, is compress X, compress Y, and send them, okay? And the astonishing result is actually an old result due to Slepkin and Wolf, which says that essentially there is a so-called rate region, which says how many bits per second you have to give to this guy and to that guy. And the rate region is, uh, is, is lower bounded by, maybe graphically it's nicer to see, uh, clearly you need the sum of the rates to be equal, to be larger or equal to the joint entropy, because that's what you would get if you would jointly code them. Okay, so if X and Y were present at a single terminal, then Shannon tells you that you would actually need at least H of X and Y, the entropy, so the joint entropy of X and Y. But what's interesting is that you have two other lower bounds here, and uh, what happens is that the lower bounds would tell you that you cannot do better uh, than, the, than uh, these guys, but actually there is a region where you can do actually quite a bit better than uh, what separate coding would tell you, which essentially the intuition is that you can code X as if you knew Y, even though you don't. Okay? Now this is a, is a sort of typical counterintuitive information theoretic results, because I just told you you couldn't talk to each other, right? Of course, if I gave you y at x, you could code at h of x given y. But actually, I'm not giving you y, and you can still do it. Okay? It's, however, quite complicated to do. Okay? It requires some fancy uh, arguments. In certain cases, it can be done. And I'm going to show later an example where we can do it for acoustic fields. Okay? So just to show that this is not just an abstract information theoretic result. Okay, but this sort of, this obsesses information theorists for the last 30 years because it has not been expanded, uh, extended to the case when this is lossy compression. So what I showed here, step in Wolf, is you have lossless compression of X and Y. Okay, now let me skip this, which is uh, a case which I don't have to, time to discuss. But um, what we did is that we said, okay, so let's look at the data we have, which is acoustic fields. And in the acoustic fields case, we asked a question, actually, the lossy rate distortion, uh, distributed rate, rate distortion function, we said, can we do better compression of a bunch of sensors that don't talk to each other, but that know a priori that what they are listening to is driven by the wave equation, okay? So it's a case where we take the physics, which drives the structure of the signals you acquire, and then we derive an information theoretic result I don't really have time to give justice to this uh, thing, which is, uh, is very cute, not very hard, but it uses some fancy sampling, well, uh, fancy if you, if you, uh, if you take the, the direct approach, but it essentially says something very simple is that you take your, your set of microphones and you do some sampling pattern which is not a, a separable traditional sampling pattern, but something that is called quincunx sampling. And then by magic, the spatial temporal uh, spectrum actually happens to be a wide spectrum. And then essentially you can do ideal compression in a distributed fashion without the terminals talking to each other. And uh, what this in the end says is that for Acoustic fields, we actually, that's the work of Bob Consbrook, a PhD student of Emre Teletar and myself, 
we can actually solve the distributed rate distortion problem, which is considered to be a very nasty problem uh, in classic information theory. Okay, does it, make a, does it make a difference? Well, this is a rate distortion function which trades off rate with uh, quadratic error. And here you have essentially the two curves of either a centralized quarter where you have everything at your disposal to do compression or this neat trick I showed just earlier and they hug each other, so that's good. If you don't use this, you get quite a bit of loss, right? I mean, you could see that you know, the rate would be double or worse, right? Which is not, you know, which wouldn't be good news in this particular case. Remember, we're talking about, you know, sensors where uh, the rate that is used is a killer because it will use energy for communication. Okay, good. Let me move to what I said is the uh, controversial part of the talk. And um, to do this, I come back actually to a historical perspective. And you'll pardon my insisting here on, on going back to Shannon, but it's always good to sort of go back to the initial problem and see uh, how it was set up. So the initial problem that Shannon did 50 years ago, uh, while idling at Bell Labs in the corridors, I guess, uh, he was actually trying to solve a very practical problem, which was simply speech communication for AT&T, right? And what did he do is something it's good to step back into this because uh, sometimes our students forget why we do the things we do them. So the problem was, remember, communication from A to B, right? You have a person with a mobile phone speaking and it has to go over a wireless channel to another person that wants to listen to this conversation. So we have a source which is analog, right? It's analog speech. It's a waveform uh, which has analog values over continuous time. And uh, the receiver lives in analog world. We want to hear you know, something coming out of a loudspeaker, uh, driving you know, uh, waves into your ear so you can listen. Okay? So the end result is analog. And all of this goes over an analog channel. So wireless channel is a physical reality, is analog. Okay? And Shannon, and, and that shows the genius of the guy, right? says, well, I am going to solve this in digital world in a countable digital world. Okay, so first there is sampling, which I'm going to ignore here, so because that's the trivial part of the result. But then he says, we map this continuum of amplitudes into a discrete set, a countable set, through something called source coding by using vectors and so on. It's not important how it's done, but it goes from something that is uncountable into a world where things are countable, okay? And this countable world, I give it an index here, which is a digital index, I give it to a channel coder, which will generate analog values to go over the wireless channel using some signaling functions. Okay, so I take this index, and here, of course, I generate you know some vectors in some sense, which live in the analog world. At the channel decoder, I try to decode you know which vector analog vector has been sent, and I have, you know if I can decode it, it will give me the index of the vector, which I give to the source decoder which will generate an analog signal. Okay. Now, this is amazing because it's completely counterintuitive that you would solve the initial problem by going to this completely new domain. Remember, this is 1948. There were no digital computers. There was no, not even mathematical theory for these discrete problems and so on. Right? Um, now, the bad news, that's the good news, but we should, we should you know, appreciate that this is a miracle, okay, that you can solve this. And it would be very astonishing that you could solve other problems by using this magic trick, okay? And uh, so we spend a lot of time on, on this little toy problem with Michael Gaspar, uh, who was also a PhD student uh, at, at EPFL and is now at uh, UC Berkeley. And, um, and we thought, well, is this going to work in uh, the more general case of distributed sources? Okay, let me skip this. This is just a textbook example, but um, we looked at a very, very simple toy problem, because I'm a, a great believer in toy problems for understanding the basic uh, underpinnings of you know, the bigger question. And the problem is the following. You have a single source, S, and you observe it with a sensor network. So you have a bunch of sensors, N sensors, which observe the source not exactly, otherwise it would be trivial. You would only need one. But each one observes a noisy version of the source. Okay? So let's say you are in here. There is a single guy speaking, okay, and you have, you know, 50 microphones, and, you know, there is background noise, right? 
And each of the microphones here gets a version, a noisy version of the source, sends it to a base station, and the base station tries to recover S, to estimate S. Okay? Now, if you look at this, and, you know, and if you know too much information theory, okay, so that sometimes it's risky to know too much, so you, know, you have studied very hard and so on, then you look at this, you say, oh, this is a famous distributed uh, correlated uh, source coding problem because I have n uh, versions, uh, so m signals, they are highly correlated. I'm going to use a very, very fancy correlated source coding algorithm. Okay? And then you hand over whatever you have done to a communications engineer, and if he knows information theory, he says, hmm, this is a so-called multi-access channel. It's a multi-terminal, multiple input, single output, multi-access channel. I'm going to use some very fancy multiple input, single output uh, coding scheme using LDPC code or something very fancy. OK, great. And you can solve the problem. But implicitly, you have used a digital representation. Because when you have done source coding, you have mapped analog values into bits. Okay? And the guy doing the uh, channel coding has taken the bits and put them onto an analog channel. And uh, so implicitly, we have gone to this discrete domain, this countable domain, right? Which is optimal in the point-to-point -point case, OK? Now, if you don't know any information theory, so we pretended we didn't know the information theory, right? So, so we looked at the problem. We said, hmm, there must be a simpler version to solve the problem. So let me show you the simple version. The simple version is something called uncoded transmission. You say, oh, I have these noisy observations. Uh, when I put them on the channel in analog fashion, the channel just takes a sum. The sum will actually uh, average out the noise, so the variance will go down as 1 over n. Okay? The variance of the noise will disappear magically because the channel actually helps us solve the problem. Okay? Of course, you know, we might not want to do this in reality, but as a thought experiment, this is interesting. Okay. Now, if you do this and you go through the map, and you do the optimal decoder here, knowing you know, uh, that you have m sources and you know the variance of the, of the noise at the sources, etc. It's not too hard to show that the quadratic error, as a function of the number of, of observers, will go down as 1 over m. Okay? And it's sort of uh, straightforward to show this. Now, the bad news is that if you use separation, very fancy source coding and channel coding, then the noise will only go down as 1 over, over log m, right? And as you know, log is very, very small, a uh, very, very slow function. And so we actually have an exponential suboptimality by using classical separation going to the digital domain, OK? So it's very bad news, OK? And what's even worse is that um, that's a question that Michael Gaspar likes to ask, is that, you know, in the world we know the currency are bits. You know, when we try to, when we transmit something, we sort of put everything into bits, and then we hand it over. We put it into packets or whatever, and these currencies has built a digital world, right? I mean, from MP3 to the internet, everything is based on a currency, which is the bit, okay? Like the dollar in the financial system, right? And <laughs> so here, bad news. In this very little uh, toy example, in this simple toy example, what we show is that by going to this bit currency, you have exponential suboptimality. Okay, you go from MSC goes from one over n to one over log n, and that's a good question. But you know what? It's unknown today. What would be the replacement for bits? Right. So we are at the same stage as Shannon was in 1948. Okay, because before Shannon, everybody was just doing analog things and you know messing up with with you know analog amplifiers and so on. And Shannon came, he said, no, no, you haven't understood the problem. You just have to, new, to use bits, right? And then you can solve the problem. And we have built you know, the entire information infrastructure based on this. And here I'm just bringing out, showing a little example that in the distributed case, for example, in sensor networks, this would, that would actually not be the right way to solve the problem. OK. Good. As you can guess, when I go and you know, tell this at Bell Labs or at uh, Nokia, they're not very amused, right? So, because it's essentially back to square one. OK, now I'm not saying we're going to throw away our computers. You know, that's not going to happen. And you will see sensor networks we actually build and deploy, of course, use bits to communicate. Because from a systems engineering point of view, it's completely unknown how you would use a result like the one I showed here. 
But from an intellectual point of view, I find it quite intriguing. OK, good. So I promised I would show that uh, these things actually have applications. And uh, so I'm going to talk about environmental monitoring. And uh, the, the motivation for this was the following. So we, we, we were working on the theory of sensor networks. We had some people doing some, some little toy uh, implementations and so on. And then we said, OK, all our American friends work on homeland security. Fine. Uh, let's find you know, a problem here, which is more science oriented. And so we talked to environmental engineering people uh, at, at EPFL initially. And uh, these people essentially go to the mountains with these devices here. And the piece like this is about $100,000. It's very heavy. You need a helicopter to bring it up and so on. And it has a data logger. So if there is a problem, you come three months later and everything is lost, etc. And so we said, oh, uh, to, to the guy Marc Parlange, who is my, my colleague in environmental engineering, we said, you know, we have very cheap devices, right? $10 devices, $100 devices. Well, we were sort of overselling the point. By now, they're actually more like $1,000 a piece. But, you know, that's $100,000. That's still a bargain because you could put a lot of these over a large area, have very, very dense sampling of phenomena before you run up the cost of this. And the other thing we promised to Marc Parlon, she said, well, it's, it's good because we are going to move you to the 21st century. Okay? Here, they would do deployments. They would not know anything about what is happening until they would go back months later and you know, uh, essentially take out the, the data logger, go back to town, and you know, plug it into their PC. Right? This thing, of course, will be online. Right? And this, uh, the, the cost factor and the fact that it will be online uh, definitely intrigues these people in the user community in environmental monitoring quite a bit. OK. So we expect that actually this field of environmental monitoring will be completely transformed by sensor networks, right? I mean, when we started 2005, I think, uh, nobody was doing this in the environmental field. Now there's actually a startup out of uh, EPFL and other places that essentially has this as a, as a business model. OK. Um, so there is a large team working on this. It's headed by Guillermo Barracnea, who is a, a, a postdoc in the lab, plus, as I said, uh, people from envi uh, environmental engineering. And um, we called the project SensorScope <clears throat> for obvious reasons. It's like a telescope, but you know, using sensing. And uh, we, we built uh, a first deployment in this building here, uh, where Luciano used to live. Where that's Luciano's office. Uh, <laughs> it's still there, you know, we have kept everything. So it's, that's, you, know, you know, the guy moved to Google, you know. So, anyway. <laughs> yeah, like Einstein's room in the patent office in Bern, right? Uh, sorry. So, so, first we did some deployments inside the building, uh, which is a, you're welcome to visit. It's a beautiful building. Uh, uh, for computer science and communications at, at EPFL. I think it's the nicest building on campus. So we're very lucky to be there. And uh, so th the first deployment was, was done there over the summer by a summer student. You know, these are always the guys sort of pushing the envelope and, and, and picked up by uh, a bunch of graduate students. And that gave us some learning experience on how to run actual uh, sensor networks. The basis is, uh, is something called the tiny node, which is built by a startup in the Parc Scientifique at EPFL. It's a sort of a very low power version of uh, the Berkeley mode, which is a, a thing out of Berkeley that uh, many people use. And it runs on top of tiny OS, which is the lightweight operating system uh, by David Culler at, uh, at Berkeley. OK. And then from there, we said, well, let's do the real thing, which is to actually go up into the mountains. And I'll talk quite a bit about this deployment because that's a fun one. Uh, but before going there, you know, we gradually did more and more complex deployments, larger scale, and so on. We improved the hardware, the software, the networking, and now the data analysis. OK, good. So the basis of sensor scope is uh, cheap uh, yet powerful weather station. So this weather station measures uh, nine environmental uh, sets of data uh, with sampling rates of the order of a minute, typically. 
and it's autonomous. It has a, a solar panel, and it has a nearest neighbor communication based on a, a unlic an unlicensed band to distances of a few hundred meters, depending a little bit on what environment you are. And uh, then one of the stations has a GPRS link uh, to go down over, over you know, the, the, the regular wireless network. And these guys are, you know, relatively cheap, uh, sturdy. They have been developed over, you know, a couple of years uh, so as to be very, uh, uh, you know, to fulfill the task at hand for environmental monitoring so we can put them on glaciers, on rock glaciers, and so on. And uh, they can be deployed very quickly and they are essentially immediately online. Okay, so this is a, that's one of the features. I'll, I'll show one particular deployment where we actually used uh, this feature. Okay, then uh, all this stuff is uh, downloaded to databases and interfaced on the web on a on a you know public web page where you can go and look real time monitoring. You can download the data, and there is some initial analysis that is done on the interface, some visualization. And I think the cute thing here for environmental monitoring people is that it's actually real time. They are completely unused to actually have access to their data immediately. Um, they are also unused to have such large quantities of data, I have to say, because now they're actually spending months and months to actually just deal with the data. Okay, so that's why I said ultimately probably you know uh, people like Google will crunch this stuff for them. Because obviously they, they don't have the, the skill set uh, in house to deal with you know uh, megabytes and megabytes of uh, environmental data at the time. Okay, uh, so one deployment was done uh, right on campus, and let me also maybe say what it is used for. Uh, this project by the environmental monitoring people uh, was about understanding the microclimate over what they call the built environment. So a lot of studies are done on microclimates over uh, agricultural land, for example, or in forests. Uh, but uh, you know, a campus like EPFL is sort of uh, semi-densely built uh, environment, so it's like a city, not very dense city. And um, they want to understand what influence this has on the heat flux, on the wind, and so on. And so about 100 stations were actually on EPFL campus for a nine months development that generated quite a bit of data. And according to these people, it's, uh, you know, this is new sets of data from which they can you know, uh, develop refined models for what actually is happening in this microclimate. OK. Um, well, that's the obvious infrastructure. Once you have the, the network set up, uh, you have this base station. Uh, so that's multi-op communication. The base station talks to a web server at EPFL. Uh, it's also, I should mention, this is also put to a web server that Microsoft actually operates uh, because they're one of the sponsors of this part of your project. They are, if you don't quote, I should be careful, right? I might end up on YouTube. So, uh, okay, so <laughs> let me leave it at that. Uh, okay, and um, let me maybe simply say, uh, the, the obvious, right? So, how does a, a multi-hop network work? It's actually a homegrown uh, uh, networking protocol by François Ingelhuis, uh, who is uh, the key networking guy on the project. It's uh, what you do is that you maintain hop tables to the sink, uh, but what you do is you do randomized next hop uh, choice. So, this fellow will look for a neighbor that has fewer hops than he has. Right, three hops, so we will use this one or that one, but it will use it in a randomized fashion. So that's quite important because these sensor networks, this is not a wired network. These guys, these links have high variation over time, and so you don't want to have to maintain, for example, shortest route tables because they would change all the time. And instead, what you do is you sort of say, well, I have a selection of neighbors that are closer to this base station, and I'm going to randomly, or maybe in a weighted random fashion, select one of the neighbors. That also distributes the load, which is very important for energy consumption. OK. And uh, for this, of course, you need to uh, have um, a hop table, which you maintain. And you also need timestamps, because you take samples every minute. And later on, you want to do interpolation over space and time. And these guys are very cheap, and they, have non they don't have very precise clocks. So what you do is 
you essentially have a synchronization protocol so people maintain relatively accurate clocks with respect to, you know, this guy has an accurate clock because it's on a GPRS link. Okay. Um, and then you do a lot of study on power usage. And, you know, I know Google is very interested in power usage, but for different type of IT infrastructure. But it's interesting here, you have very similar questions, you know, uh, different tasks take completely different amounts of energy, and so you want to optimize how we actually use the infrastructure so as to minimize power consumption. And this leads actually to an interesting work that is ongoing, which is if you look at this infrastructure, at first what you do is that you optimize the power usage on one weather station, right? You say, okay, I'm going to turn it on every five minutes, and then I take, you know, five seconds to rendezvous with my neighbors, blah, 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 right? And then you discover that, well, that's good, but, you know, this guy actually doesn't have to work very hard because this guy has to work very hard. He's a relay for many neighbors, right? So this guy is actually going to go down first because he does much more communication. He's in the critical path, right? And then you look at the problem and you say, hmm, what you really want to do is global energy optimization. Okay? You want to have a handover protocol because you might have more than one thing. Maybe you have several things because this guy, of course, also consumes a lot of power. Right? So you might have a network with, let's say, 100 uh, sensor stations. And out of the 100, maybe 10 have a GPRS-enabled link. And then what you want to do is a sort of randomized protocol that hands over the task of doing the data gathering and the GPS uh, link randomly to one of the 10 stations, right? But of course, each time you change the base station, you have to change this entire routing table, etc. So you don't want to do this too often, right? Because then you spend your time sort of handing over, right? And that's well known in, 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 uh, uh, you know, in all mobile communications. The handover process when you go from one base station to, to another one is, is sort of a tricky one, takes resources. You know, sometimes it fails and so on. Okay, so without getting into details, there's a beautiful problem which says, how do you actually globally manage uh, power in a network like this? Okay, and once you see the deployments, you will, you'll see that actually you have to take uh, the environmental data into account. Okay, so the deployment is up here, and, you know, one station might be back there. This is actually south. So this station doesn't see much sun, right? So you don't want to use that one as your base station very often because it doesn't get much energy, right? So you have to take statistics actually on how much energy you gather in the network with your different solar panels. Okay, it's a very interesting global sort of energy optimization problem versus communication infrastructure. Anyway, um, now what we then did from the deployment we had on campus, we said, well, let's move from theory to practice and theory looks like this. You know, it's some nice deployment on the green field, and the practice is this rather dramatic location somewhere high up in the Alps. Um, if you want to go and change a battery, it's a four-hour hike, okay? So, you know, if the thing goes down, tough luck. Um, and uh, let me just say why we went there. Let me skip this one. I don't have time to talk about this one. Um, the reason why we went to this remote place, and it's, this is a true story. I'm not just doing this for marketing. Uh, despite what you might think, is that this high valley where we did the deployment is the source of some mud flows that come down and every now and then take out the train line down in the valley. Okay? And so the people that are interested in environmental hazards actually were interested. We would do a monitoring up there for several months to try to understand why in the world these mud flows would actually come down. So... Uh, the good news is that they were kind enough to, you know, pay for actually doing the deployment uh, for the helicopter rides and so on, because otherwise it's it's really a tough place. And uh, the place, as you can see on Google Earth, okay, is up here. The mud flow comes down in this uh, valley. You know, it's very steep, and so it comes down very quickly. And this is uh, an interesting uh, microclimate because it's a rock glacier. Okay, we'll, we'll see a picture uh, in a minute, and here you see a deployment. I think there were something like 17 stations. Uh, all these stations up here have no connection to the wireless network because it's uh, so remote. There is just one at the very end that actually is in line of sight, I think, of a base tower of Swisscom. 
And so that's the one that actually has the GPR isolate. Okay. And this is, you know, a, a sort of, if you like mountains, this is a great, uh, great place to go and work on IT, okay? Uh, so that's, uh, that was, you know, quite an experience to do a deployment up there, but it's a you know, very remote but a beautiful place. And along this uh, project, we did something actually fun, which was at some point somebody said, okay, it's great to measure, you know, wind and temperature and humidity and so on, but actually we, we don't know if there is fog or if it's snowing, right? And you can sort of try to figure out, but it's, it's okay. So finally, you know, we're actually image processing people. So finally we said, well, maybe we should put the camera out there, right? And so um, and that was before Android days, right? So we had to, to, to develop a, an autonomous camera that would take an image every 15 minutes or so uh, with a GPRS link, uh, would sound, send images down. And this camera is, was sitting up there for... Uh, almost two years, right, and would wake up every now and then, even after we had taken down the sensor network. And you, should, you, you know, could see the snow conditions, you know, was it a nice day, was it foggy, and so on. Um, it had some on, very simple onboard image processing, but actually now we are working exactly on this problem, which is very low power distributed image processing to have on each sensor weather station actually a little camera, because it's just so useful to have visual feedback uh, in such deployments. Okay, so what did we learn from this? Let me maybe show uh, this one. So uh, then you have a problem. This is uh, just showing temperature evolution over time over this rock glacier. And what you discover, of course, you can also discover it by drilling five meters down the rock, is that there is a glacier underneath the rock, which you don't, you don't see. And this glacier actually is an accumul you know, accumulates uh, cold temperature, but it also accumulates rain when it rains up there. And I, th I think it, it creates sort of like a, a lake, which then discharges at some point, and which is the origin of this mudfall. The analysis of the data is still ongoing, so I, I don't have definite results, and I wouldn't really understand it anyway, uh, I must admit. Okay. Uh, let me finish with just uh, a little example of a very quick deployment. Uh, so, you know, these various projects, you know, sort of uh, led to a lot of contacts and then the people running the Patrouille des Glaciers, which is a famous uh, 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 ski, uh, ski alpinism race in, in, in the Swiss Alps, uh, which goes from Zermatt to Verbier. Um, if you are into, you know, high mountain skiing, it's, you know, it's a classic race to go. It's, it's quite challenging. Uh, and uh, they asked us to actually monitor the race at some, dis, you know, uh, at some specific points, for example, Tête Blanche, which is close to Zermatt, which is at uh, 3,700 meters. It can get extremely cold, so they actually used this data. I mean, there, there was visual feedback, and there was temperature, wind, etc. And they were actually using this for security reasons, because uh, these weather conditions are very bad. Uh, you know, it's not a good idea to let uh, a few hundred people go over there. And that's an example where, you know, you can deploy a monitoring network very, very quickly, make it run for a week, and then take it down again. Uh, very low-cost sort of monitoring of uh, the real environment. Okay. Um, let me skip this. Let me skip the conclusion, which is sort of vanilla, and finish by, you know, showing you a New Yorker cartoon. Um, which talks about Google Earth, right? You probably have seen this one, right? So you're at the barber and, uh, you know, it says, oh, you want to see the top on Google Earth. Now, uh, my prediction is that we are going actually to see real-time sensor network monitoring uh, on Google Earth, you know, uh, you know, very soon, right? I mean, that's the expectation that you have satellite data, uh, ground truth uh, monitoring, et cetera, online on a service like Google Earth, I think is really where we are heading at uh, very, very soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions?